if you are if you fall into the the species categorized as male please give yourself a pat on the back right now well done for getting here whether you were dragged here tied and dragged behind the car i'm not sure um, maybe you were drugged and you're still coming out of it but it's good i'm glad you are here uh, i just want to commend each and every one of you uh, for being here uh, marriage and, and working on your relationship um, is is truly an investment um, and ladies if you if you don't believe me that that investing in your marriage is a good thing and it is indeed um, a good investment do you remember that day on your wedding day when you hugged your husband and your arms locked around his waist try that again there's been a good return on investment there hey growth has happened that is a great investment indeed just kidding marriage uh, is indeed a, a beautiful thing relations are, relationships are a beautiful thing and i know there's a trend worldwide uh, for for people to no longer get married the institution of, of marriage is being disregarded uh, but i but i read that just last year there were 4 million 153,237 people that got married. That is a fantastic statistic. But there's just one thing wrong with that figure. I would have expected it to be an even number. Yeah, each and every one of us uh, can always do better at our, at our marriages. Um, and I know some of you are good. Uh, I know some of you are real romantics here. Like the guy who who bought his wife 25 yellow long-stemmed roses for their 25th wedding anniversary, had them delivered to her office, uh, and in return, she picked each and every petal, dried them, and brought them home and spread them all over their bed. Yeah, she slipped into something comfortable, appropriate, but comfortable, and lay on the bed and waited for her husband to return. When he got home, there was indeed a reaction. He excitedly exclaimed, wow, are those potato chips? Okay, okay. I'm going to get serious now. It is uh, my privilege tonight um, to ask Andre and Sonny to come up. Oh, look at that. Um, it, is, uh, it is really an honor for me to, uh, to introduce um, both Andre and Sonica to you. Um, they are an incredible couple, and I know that... that the few words that I'm going to say now are echoed um, by you guys um, who, who know them, if not just a little bit of their public persona, um, but also who know them well. I have the privilege of, of being in their presence very often. Um, I'm in their home. We, we meet together. We discuss many things. Uh, and I've seen how their relationship works. Um, and it is, it is truly a beautiful example. Uh, they get it right, but they also get it wrong. Okay, that gives you grace. It gives us grace. We can also get it wrong. Um, but what they do beautifully is they honor one another, um, and they will, they will always say when, when they get it wrong. Um, occasionally, on the off chance that they do get it wrong, in, in, our, in our presence, we get a message on our, on our office group, both of them apologizing for their part played. Even if it's 5%, you know, Sonica owns her 5%. Uh, Andre just has to take his 95 um, <laughs> but uh, they own it, you know, and that's just so beautiful, the way they, they work on their relationship. They just have, have two things that stand out for me so much. Their, their relationship is God-centered. Christ is at the middle of it. Uh, they, it guide, he guides them through, through everything. And the second thing is that they work on their relationship constantly. So I want to honor you guys again for being here. Uh, and I want to ask you just to open your hearts to receive from them. Open your hearts to your spouse. Open your hearts to God. Uh, I believe he's here and he is working tonight. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, JP. Yes, yeah, only in, in, in one office meeting that my wife told me to shut up. So we have a good track record in general. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes dig a hole for myself and then JP looks at me and says, Andre, stop digging. Stop digging. Uh, so we, I mean, we're passionate about relationship and... Uh, I'm really passionate about this lady. Uh, I just realize, yeah, um, so much of what I have in life is because of, because of Sonica. And uh, yeah, the quality of life wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for, for her in my life. So <laughs> I met this man when he was 19 years old, when he still had a six pack. So what JP said earlier today is very true, you know, after 
almost 22 years of marriage. But he was the cool one. I was a very uncool one. And I somehow he noticed me. I don't know how because, you know, my mom made all my clothes. That, so he, he commented, you know, later I heard, you know, that he couldn't figure out this girl with a funny, you know, where does she get these clothes? But in any case, somehow, somehow he noticed me. And yeah, we got married when he was 23. So four years later, we, we said the I do's. I was 24 years old, so I'm a, I'm a year and a half older than Andre. And we were, we were young, we were inexperienced. I don't think we really knew what we were in for, but I think the one thing that we had in common was we were committed to make this work, you know, to, to, to stick together. We were committed to stick together in the good and the bad. And yeah, we celebrated last, oh, two years ago, we celebrated our 20th anniversary with friends. There's one or two photos if you want to see what it looked like. It was an amazing celebration. And this year, on the 17th of March, we will celebrate 22 years of being together. Well, of marriage. We're together for a bit longer than that, but 22 years of marriage, which is a gift. And I'm just so thankful. Mm. <laughs> we are thankful. So, uh, you know, I, I, I heard about <clears throat> these two fishermen. They were standing next, next to the beach, and they were fishing, and the, fishing, and the one guy turned to the other one and said, hey, how's your, how's your marriage doing? And he responded, no, great. It's like a solid five out of ten. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized sometimes our expectations are quite low, especially over some time. We sometimes, we just get used to average, and then we just allow like five out of ten is like amazing. And, then, and, and that's not what it should be. I really believe it should be way higher than a 5 out of 10. So w tonight, we want to fan the flame. We want to get those flames burning. Okay. And sometimes those flames get blown out. Okay, but we're going to talk about that as well a little bit. We're going to do two sessions tonight with a break in the center, in the middle there. So... Uh, so hold on for coffee and just to, for the joy set before you. Um, but we're really wanting to add and help you guys to have an amazing, um, amazing relationship, a wonderful marriage, if you future marriage, if you're not married yet. And, uh, you know, and, and it's like our background, my, my parents divorced when I was in primary school and the pain and the heartache that we went through. And, you know, we often counsel people and then also to see the hurting and the pain and the missing one another. So we are really passionate about having to help people have beautiful relationships. Okay, and we, so we've been praying a lot and preparing and we, we really trust we're going to share tonight is going to help you. It's really going to help you and help you to fan that flame and to move forward. Now, when you start off and you fall in love, the expectations are very high. You are so excited. It's like passion, excitement, like expectations. Woo! Okay? And as some of us, you know, really deep dived far back in the past now, like, yeah, who was dying? Yeah. I'm like, can't remember. <laughs> okay, but so, so, so go into your archives and go and remember what that felt like to pursue your partner and to be excited. And to, to be that in love feeling. I, I really believe it, you can continue to pursue one another. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. And so I want to stir that in you. I want to give you a few tips, okay? So in a, in a, in a, some Christian pickup lines, just to help you guys again. So you need to get touch base there again. Remember, guys, when you were like pursuing and you did stupid, like, you know, rap videos like I did this week, you know, is you do stupid because you're in love. Okay, so for some of us, here's, here's a good pickup line. Guys, you could say to the, to Mr., you must not role play with your spouse. Okay, it's something like this. I'm usually not very prophetic, but I can see us together. <laughs> eh? That's a good one. Or maybe, or maybe you can say something along the lines, I just want you to know I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Eh? Also a good one. And the ladies, one for you. 
You can turn to your partner and you can say that to him right now. You can say, hey, you put the stud into Bible study. (laughs) Come on, come on, help him out there. You put the stud into Bible study. We're in a church, so we must keep it Christian, Christian uh, ways of doing it. But so um, we got married when I was 23. I would have married a year earlier um, (laughs) if I could. But I was studying, and I was still studying when we got married, and, uh, and we know when I was from 19, so when I was 19, so she's my wife. Sonic is the, the wife of my youth. But when it comes to kindling the flame, you need to continuously kindle the flame. You need to continuously invest in one another. And it doesn't take a lot. It just takes a little bit of investing. So we want to we wanna encourage you to Pursue one another again. Okay, so that I want to I stir that by the end of tonight, I'm, I'm trusting you're going to be stirred to pursue one another again. Okay. I mean, so I think the part of the original excitement when we, when we meet somebody is actually for, you know, what that person can do for us. We don't think through it properly, but I mean, if somebody makes you happy, you want to be with that person, right? And... I mean, the reality is when we start off in a relationship, there's just many good things happening. The quality time and the gifts are just flowing. And we would even do things we don't really enjoy. You know, don't tell pe- yo, don't tell everybody, you know, we're still dating that. They, they must just believe that they enjoy each other so much. But, no, no, we have to warn you. <laughs> okay, let's warn you. Let's, let's warn all the dating people. They don't know what we're talking about now. All married people understand. Normally how it works is before getting married, the guy pursues like crazy. And then when he catches, he's bulky. He chills. <laughs> but you guys aren't, JP, you're not going to do it like that. I know, Anna, don't worry. Don't, JP don't is, worry, JP is exceptional. Don't worry. You know, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we want to stir the... The hunting of the bookie again tonight. Okay, yep. come on, Dave. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Yeah, we're yes. going to stir that. So we, we do things we don't necessarily enjoy, but we just want to be with that person. But the problem is if, if I become dependent on what Andre can do for me, then I become very vulnerable. And this is what we've learned. You know, if, if my, my happiness or, or flame, if the quality or the strength of my little love flame depends on him and what he can do for me, I actually become very vulnerable because what happens? Life happens. You know, life happens. You have a baby, which is a wonderful blessing. But now what happens? Your wife is tired all the time. Or, and now you think, where's the fun? Where's the joy? Where's my wife? You know, it's life happens. Or your husband is under pressure and he comes home from work, he's under pressure, he's burdened, and now you think, where's the romance? You know, things happen, or just sickness, you know, if we get sick, we're not the same, and I think that is, that is our challenge, because in a, in a season when we pursue each other, it just comes more naturally, so there's this beautiful scripture that says, 1, 1 John 4 verse 8, that says, but, but if anyone does not love, anyone who does not lo- love does not know God, for God is love. And what what we have learned is if I tap into the God of love, if I if I get my fulfillment, if I spend time with God and he fills up, or he strengthens that flame, my capacity to fan the flame in our marriage becomes stronger, my own capacity, and I become less needy for Andre to fan my flame. I become less needy. And that is a game changer. It's actually a game changer in a relationship because I become less needy, but I also have more to give. And this is what we want to want to just lay as a foundation. This is the, okay, yeah. the so, source. So, so the source of the flame, we talk about fanning the flame, but the source ultimately is God because he is the God of love. Mm. Okay? So when you start off, I know all the dating people are just like looking at me, what are you talking about? Okay, but as time progresses, you need to get that source. God becomes your source, and then you can overflow your love to your partner. Okay, so three principles we want to share in this session. The first one, you need to fire your spouse. Not divorce, fire. Fire them from the job of fulfilling you. Don't look to your partner 
to be your everything and to be the one that, that fulfills you in life. You're going to be in trouble because they can't do it. They, you, they were not made to fulfill you in your deepest core. They are the extra, the cherry on top, the what a blessing. But God is the one that fulfills. So here's a, a, a great quote by Chip Judd. He says, stop looking to your spouse to give you only what God can. So this is where we have to start. We have to position ourselves in the right space if we want to have a healthy, beautiful. Again, we're not talking about a, a five out of 10. That's awesome. No, we're talking about an eight, a nine. That's where you can be. That's what God wants for us. He wants something that you like still in love. You're 85, you're holding hands, you're still in love. And I sometimes at the airport and I see like an older couple holding hands and I'm like, I don't think they're married. <laughs> and then I look at the hand and there are no rings. Then I'm like, ah. Oh. But every now and again, you see a couple that are, are, are been married for 40 or 50 years and they're still in love. And when God is your source, that's possible. Okay, so that's why you need to position yourself in that space. And so where do we get these ideas of, because most people get the ideas not from God or from the Bible, we get it from Hollywood. And what does Hollywood tell us? In every movie almost, there's the love. The man is fighting for the love of his life, kills half the world for her, and then he, he falls in love, he wins her heart, they get married, and then happily ever after. No, there's an after story as well. Fight after fight after fight. Missing one another. Where's the joy? And here's the baby. And what's we doing? And we're not sleeping. And ah, <laughs> they don't tell that part. And so what happens is you find yourself there and you're like, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with her? You know, you start doubting if, if this is to be. And so you have, to, you have to fire your spouse if you want in terms of the job of fulfilling you. Okay, so quickly turn to him or her. Just tell him, I'm, I'm firing you. Come on. I'm firing you. You're fired. Okay, no, we're not talking divorce. Eh? We're talking about firing you just from being fulfilled. Okay, but there's action after the wedding day. And you have to, you have to say this. You have to say you are not my source. I have to say, Sonica, you're not my source. God is my source. So what that enables you is that if she's down or without joy or struggling, I am still anchored. My happiness, my joy is not dependent on her state. But if you are dependent on your partner's internal atmosphere or how she or he's feeling, you're in trouble. Okay, so that's really important to, to you need to put your love or your trust in God. Maybe I, I could just clarify, it doesn't mean that we become robots, okay, with no feelings and no emotions, and you can't communicate your desires, and you, you just, you know, you can do whatever you want, so I'm going to be okay. It's not like that, right? We are relational beings, but what we're trying to say is our primary source of fulfillment and strength is not your spouse. <laughs> But you That's can critical. communicate. You should communicate. We should talk. We should, he should know what, I, what, I, what my desires are. He should know how he could help me fulfill mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we become just this person with no desires, no yes. feelings. No, we're going we're gonna, to, in the second session, we're going to look at fulfilling dreams. Okay, but so here's a beautiful scripture, 1 John 4, 16. And it says, we know how much God loves us. God is love. God is the source of love. But it says, and we have put our trust... In his love. Okay? So that's where you have to start. Ladies, put your trust in God's love. And secondly, in your husband or the man's, in his love. But first, God's never going to fail you. His love is consistent, eternal, always faithful. So put your faith, your trust in him. God is love and all who live in love live in God and put, and God lives in them. So put your trust in his love. And I've just seen in our relationship, this, it, just re it really works. The moment you are not happy on the inside and you expect another person to do it for you, you're in trouble because you're like, eh, I don't know, but there's maybe someone else is better than you with somebody else. You can say, oh, something's still not. You're always seeking because ultimately what you're looking for is found in God. But when you're fulfilled in Him, then you can overflow your love to your partner. Okay, so the first one is fire your spouse. 
Second one, if you want to kindle the flame, is you need to understand that you will have trouble. Legit, let that sink in. You will have trouble. And this is, this, the Bible says it. 1 Corinthians 7, 28. I think this is why the Apostle Paul never got married. <laughs> he said, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life. P.S. That's why I'm not getting married. I am running <laughs> the other direction. That was what Paul said. I think he missed out. I, think, I personally think he missed out. But so the point is, you will have trouble, okay? And so who do you think is going to cause all that trouble? Look to, the, look to your partner. Is it them? Are they going to give you, are they going to cause you the trouble? No, it's you. You're going to cause the trouble. It's not her. It's not what she does. It's my response to what she does that will cause the trouble. Okay, so it's not your partner, it's not your spouse that will cause you the trouble, it is you. Come on, let's say it together. It, it is me. It is me. Okay, this is critical. You need to get this. I know this is a shock to many of us, especially the men. We're like, no way, it's me. No, cannot be. <laughs> you see, the, the, the problem is not the conflict. The problem is how we respond to the conflict. When we miss one another, when we miscommunicate, you know, um, and so that's really important. So Sonic is going to share the principle. Yeah, I want to, I want to explain to you something that really helped me a lot because I'm the, I'm, I tend to, want, to be the one who's really idealistic. So I, I feel after 22 years of marriage, we should do better, you know. So I've learned now that there's an 80-20 principle. Okay, 80, in general, in any company or any organization, there's an 80-20 principle. 80% of people do 20% of the work, not in this church, praise God. But in general... This is a general principle that applied to many organizations. Now, in marriage, how this works is 80% of the time in a healthy relationship with these two good world people, there's joy, there's peace, there's fun, and you do life together. But now there's 20% of life that you do together that is challenging, that is not so much fun, where there's conflict and where there's challenges. Now, maybe for some of you, that's 5%. Great. Maybe for some of you... It's 30%. It's, that's okay. The, the bottom line is there's a certain percentage of your marriage that's not going to be perfect. And you see, I had to make a peace with that because I always feel, you know, surely we can't fight over this. We must do better, you know. And when I came to the point where I realized, okay, this is going to be part of marital life, I'm, I must accept it, you know. I could actually get off that crazy cycle or that conflict moment a lot sooner and a lot quicker because what happens with us when, when we enter into an argument, you know, it, it's not only the argument eventually, it's the whole idea of us fighting that m my life feels a little bit shaken because surely it shouldn't happen, you know, and I, I realize that that is causing me to take longer to to actually deal with a conflict. It takes me longer to actually respond better or to get off this, this crazy cycle. You know? And I need to remind myself, take the pressure off yourself. Your relationship is not, this side of heaven. We're not going to have a perfect 100% relationship where there's just fun and just peace. Yeah, absolutely. I need to, I I be, need to be realistic it about it. It would probably be unhealthy if there was no conflict because it's like people, you don't care anymore. So if you actually care about the relationship, you're going to engage and you can say, right. hey, I don't like that. You know, let's talk right. about that. You know, so I think that this is really a very helpful principle, I think, especially for the ladies, if I may generalize. But I, I'm like, but that's, you know, Sonica often always be, oh, we're the only people. I'm like, no, <laughs> the other people are throwing pots and pans. <laughs> I just frowned and I'm in trouble. You know, I yeah, just I raised my more. voice a little bit. A, yeah, I raised my voice more. a little bit. And my wife's like, don't shout at me. Yeah. I'm not shouting yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the smallest little things feel so intense. Yeah, I expect a lot. <laughs> Standards are I mean, are I, married, I married this amazing man. He must, he must. Pray for me, pray for me. 
<laughs> so, so let me share a story, something that happened in our home. I'm going to be very transparent tonight. A couple of weeks ago, so our son, he's 14 years old, he did something that upset Andre. Now, I felt it was unfair of Andre to get upset. Now, I got involved, which was wrong. Next time, I'm not going to get involved. I'm just going to let the boys sort out their, their things. Okay, but, but now, maybe, maybe some backstory. Okay, go for it. On this. <laughs> so I was... Just a Saturday afternoon, we had these wonderful plans for the evening. We're going to bry, we're going to watch the Chosen series, and my son and I, we're going to exercise a little bit together. So everything was planned, and I'm just spending a bit of time with God and the Word and praying, and now I go to my son, and then everything is dear my God, because my son now, anyway, he started to exercise on his own. I was like, no, we're going to exercise together, and so I'm upset because now things are not like we were planning it, and then my wife started to chirp in there. And I'm like, but you should have told him. I told you we're going to. And so I had these plans. And so I frowned and uh, <laughs> raised my voice a little bit. <laughs> and the next moment, my wife is upset. And the tears start running down her face. And now I'm like, now I'm really upset. I's like, no. Because when she's, oh, I'm like, men, we don't like it when they cry, do we? We don't like it. So I'm like, no, this is not so bad that you should cry. <laughs> So now my son's upset, my wife's upset, I'm upset. So at some point, I just storm out and I say, this is disaster. <laughs> now, that, now I cry even more because he's, I'm causing disaster. Anyway, so now I go to the bathroom, I close the door. I say to God, Lord, I've no idea how to fix this, but I'm upset, I'm crying. Everybody's upset. Vian just disappears. And our whole night is now a disaster. So <laughs> we didn't know what to do. Okay. Well, I didn't know what to do. Okay. And I was in the bathroom. I was sitting outside on the, on the porch, and then my son actually came, Vian, and he came, and he said, Dad, I'm really sorry. And then I'm like, yo, that's okay. I forgive you. And said, I am sorry. And then I'm thinking, man, I was actually spending time with God just before all of this. I should really have more self-control than I'm showing right now or the frown and the raised voice. So then I got up. I walked. I found my wife knew she was in the bathroom. <laughs> And she's crying, and then I'm like, no, come on, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you got upset. We're going to do it, we're just going to sort it out. Anyway, we prayed together at some point, and I, within 20 minutes to 30 minutes, everything was sorted. My son and I, we were exercising, we had our bri, we had our chosen, we were laughing, we were having a wonderful evening, and it was beautiful. And Vian was just shocked that we could turn this around from this is a disaster, <laughs> to, <laughs> to we're laughing, witnessed, we're having fun. And... He obviously witnessed the whole thing from beginning to end. You see, we're only three people in the home, so we can't... Yeah, Vian, Vian sees everything that happens, you know, so when, 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 when there's an argument, he, he notices. But in any case, so now he said to me, Mommy, I can't believe that you were just crying and now you're smiling. And now... So he, he, he just he couldn't... He couldn't believe the turnaround, you know. And for me, when he said that, I just received so much faith. Because it's not always that we can turn it around so quickly. But I received faith that it's possible to turn something unexpected, an unexpected argument. We can turn it around quicker, you know. So my goal shouldn't be to avoid it completely. My goal should be... To turn it around quicker. And for me, it was real freedom. So the problem isn't conflict. Yeah. But I tell you what happens with many couples that we speak to, something like that or even, even sillier happens, and then they don't talk to one another for three days or a week. Or it's like, I'm going to divorce you. You know, it's like it just spirals out of control because the previous times there were conflicts, they didn't solve it. They didn't get to the place where you could pray together, and now you laugh about it. So we can actually laugh about it because we, we solved it. Okay, so you need to get off what they call the crazy cycle. The crazy cycle is when you start spinning and there's this conflict. You want to get off that. And I want to show you quickly how. How do we solve trouble quickly? Here's a beautiful statement. It says, the first to apologize, two slides on, the first to apologize is the bravest. Guys, who wants to be the brave one? Eh, you're ready for the burglar that breaks in, you're going to break his nose. There's something even braver than that. Say, I am sorry. 
for raising my voice, for frowning, for doing something that you shouldn't have done. The first to apologize, the first, the first. I want to I wanna highlight the first. That's the one that uh, I often ask. Let me ask this again. Who's the mature one? Okay, let's, let's quickly do a test run. In conflict, the one of the two of you that first says, I am sorry, raise the hand. Okay. Okay, okay, it's good, it's good. <laughs> There's not cl complete clarity of who that is. <laughs> but the first... To apologize is the bravest. It takes courage. It's like, hey, come on, let's solve this. We're on the crazy cycle. We're spinning. We're spinning. She's upset. I'm worked up. Now, how are we going to stop this? The first to apologize is the bravest. Then the first to forgive is the strongest. The weak people hold grudges. The strongest forgive. Amen? Anyone can have a, hold a grudge. Anyone can be angry. Anyone can remain angry. Anyone can stonewall for three days. And I'm like, I'm going to punish you, woman. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to talk to you for three days or a week. or a, But that doesn't solve anything, does it? It only makes things worse. Then that sight, it just spins even worse. So the first to apologize is the bravest. And the thing is, there's always something to apologize for. You see, most times it's like Sonica's fault, 95%, me 5%. I do not agree with what JP said. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Bottom line is, in your mind, you think 5%. Own your 5%. It's probably 85. <laughs> but own your 5%. And you can solve it. You help your partner to come to a place of healing. The first to apologize is the bravest. All the men in the house say it, I'm brave. <laughs> you can do it. The first to forgive is the strongest. In other words, you say, someone is saying, I'm sorry. Then you're like, I forgive you. It's okay. And the first to forget is the happiest. In our case, it's like we don't forget what happened, but we're laughing about it now. In the moment, we weren't laughing, but now we're laughing. That means we have forgotten the bad, the negative. And the only way you're going to do that is if you go through that process. Someone needs to apologize. And if someone starts, then the other one should follow. I am also sorry. I could have been kinder. I could have been more self-controlled. I could have not raised my voice. I could have been more patient. Huh? You could have. You could have. Instead of it's your fault. No, 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 no. I said, well, you're going to have trouble. Who's going to cause the trouble? Me. Because if she did something silly, it's my response that escalates it into a conflict. So if I would respond in a kind way, immediately you take the fuel out of the fight and you've solved it. The first to forget is the happiest. And then to actually to pray together. For me and Sonica, this is so good to pray together. And then sometimes we have to pray together again a day or two. The one that maybe still is still lingering. I'm like, what fight? I can't even remember it. No, like three months ago. No, no I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not that bad. <laughs> but it's like, oh, yesterday. I, I forgot now. I'm over. I've moved on. But for her, it's still there. And if I don't help her to deal with it, it's we're going to spin. Yeah, it's going to come up at some point <laughs> again. This is where the old cows, you know, come oh, in. Oh, queer. Yeah, it's old yeah. cows in English, yeah, no? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, queer. <laughs> so if, if the one hasn't dealt with it properly. So in our situation, often we go through the, I'm sorry, I forgive you, we pray together. And it brings a massive release. Say I'm 80% there, but I'm not 100% there. Then I have the responsibility to tell Andre, look, could we please talk about it again? So he has learned now. He has learned to say yes. Okay, He doesn't really want to, I know, because he's moved on. <laughs> but, I've moved on. <laughs> which is a good, I mean, it's a good quality. He moves on, he forgives, he forgets, he moves on. 
But if you are the one in the relationship who needs a second chance to talk through it and to pray through it, please, the other one, be gracious. You know, because the moment both parties has, if, if you have closure, both parties, it becomes a solid brick in your foundation. If one party does not have closure, they, that brick will go into your foundation, but it will be cracked. So you're laying a cracked foundation, but the moment there's closure, so conflict doesn't mean that your foundation is cracked, but conflict without closure, that means you're building with cracked bricks, which will... will and it's going to bite you at some point. Yeah. And so what, one, what, what I think some uh, generalizing, but sometimes our guys, we just want to move on and like, are you not over it yet? You know, let's just move on. You're not helping your partner. It could be other way around as well. It could be the guy that in this case, maybe he's struggling to, to deal with it. You have to help one another on that journey. So I want to say this, guys, uh, there's a song, Kurt Darren, a frosa heart is so glass. A woman's heart is like glass. So if it breaks, you have to help it to get healed up. Are you going to, it's going to bite you. She's going to lose her joy. She's going to lose her peace. You're going to, where's the joy in this relationship? You know, that kind of thing. And it's actually the same for guys. You see, for, for, for women, they, their love language is, is, is love. They want to feel love. Okay. There's this teaching around love and respect. But as guys, we are super sensitive when it comes to respect. So if a man feels disrespected, if he feels dissed, woo then we like become angry and you think, what's wrong with you? Why are you so sensitive? It's just we're different. And so it's important to understand how a man, primarily his love language is respect. You respect a guy, you speak with respect to a man, he feels loved. And I could never figure this out why I got so worked up with Sonica at times. And I realized it's because I felt disrespected. So the one time, some of those who's been with us for a while, you'll know the story. But so we went this one time to beach break, coffee shop in town. And our Friday mornings when we have our date thing, date morning. So we went to the coffee shop and I was reading this book about Christians being tortured in commun under communism. So I was on this book now for like weeks. And, but it's like really, it's touching me and it's speaking to me. I'm wanting to speak. I'm a, I'm a verbal processor. I want to share with Sonic uh, about this whole thing. So we're driving from our home down to beach break. And so I'm sharing with her about this thing that's, that's going through my head and heart. And I said, really, I'm vulnerable. I'm sharing like intensely. And then she said something that just basically like just brushed it off as nothing. I've been listening to torture stories for weeks. <laughs> so... So I wasn't sure how to approach it. I was like, She's either, so insensitive. <laughs> I was either going to tell him, please, I don't want to talk about torture stories, at, you know, during our romantic date, or I'm going to say something else. Nothing was going to be fine. I'm like, what could be better than torture stories for your romantic <laughs> date time? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's why I understand where she's coming from. But in that now moment. Now he does. In now that I, moment, he was but furious. But in that moment. I was like, in one moment, I felt disrespected. Ah, guys, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if, if anyone has a tip for me how I can do it better next time, I would gladly receive the So the anyway, wisdom. so I parked the car and it's like, you could cut the atmosphere at like with a knife. It is a mess. I'm like, women don't touch me. I don't want to talk to you. I am worked up. Now we're walking to beach, but I don't want to touch her hand. Normally I hold, hold her hand as we're walking places. I'm like, I don't want to touch you. And so I, we're walking and so now we find a table and we sit and then she's getting emotional and she's like, and now she's putting on sunglasses. And I'm again like, I don't know how we're going to save this because this is a disaster now to pull her back from, from the tears. I don't know what I'm going to do now because I'm worked up. And so anyway, so we sit down and then right in front of us, there's a guy looking straight at us that has been visiting the church. <laughs> So I'm like, my public image I is, don't care about the guy. I am like... <laughs> I'm like... This is the end of my public image. is gone. <laughs> so I'm like, so this guy is like looking straight at us. As I, <laughs> and so Sonica's head, she just drops and the tears start dripping. And I'm like, stop it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Which obviously won't help. So I really didn't know what to do. 
It was a, it was, somehow we pulled it back at some point. I'm sure I started to apologize at some point just to save the situation. But the bonus of the day was when I wanted to pay the bill, this other guy paid for us. Well, we think. We think it's him. It definitely is him. <laughs> what? So, so he saw we were struggling. So, so anyway, got, ladies, that's a tip. Next time you don't want to pay tears, <laughs> someone's going someone's gonna to pay for you. But, but this is a good story of how of forgetting something. It's not erased from your memory. It's not like as if you can't remember it anymore. But now, I mean, it was a disastrous morning. It was really not funny in the moment. But now... We've worked through it. We've forgiven each other. I understand he felt disrespected. He understood that I really didn't want to listen to torture stories another two hours. So we found each other. And now we can laugh about it. So this is your, this is your sign. This is your sign that if there was actually a fight or something that you really struggled with, if you can now laugh about it, not only one person, it doesn't help, he laughs and I'm still crying. <laughs> you must both be able to laugh about it. Then there was true healing and then it becomes this beautiful brick in your foundation. Yeah, then it's beautiful. But you have to get to the conclusion. But the point that I'm wanting to highlight is men, our love language is respect. So if we feel disrespected, it triggers us. And for a woman now that I'm triggered, so I'm responding unlovingly, and that triggers her. And then she feels, and so it's just this crazy cycle. Okay, so the third key, ending off the session with this. If you want to fan the flame, fire your spouse. You can put it on, fire your spouse. You will have trouble. Okay, so what if you know that you will have trouble, so rather laugh about it than freak out about it? Rather laugh at yourself, laugh at the situation, than actually freaking out about, oh no, we're having a fight. Yes, you will have a fight. Okay? You will have trouble. And then thirdly, you need to contend for hope. And so I want to highlight this, which is just absolutely critical. You can put on the diagram that re reveals the crazy cycle. Now this comes from the Bible. I can't unpack the whole thing now, but it reveals that uh, women are supposed to, to, to respect their husband and men are supposed to love their wife. That's a command in the scriptures. So it means unconditional. Now, the crazy cycle is this. Without love, when a woman feels unloved, her natural response is she reacts without respect. She disses the man. Because I'm looking for some love here. I'm going to diss you. And when a guy, when he feels disrespected... What does he do? He withhold love. So you go, go back to the diagram. So without love, she reacts. Without respect, he reacts. We stonewall. We become angry. Most men respond with anger. Most women would maybe cry or be more emotional in that sense. But we, men are still emotional. We just get angry. Okay, men? Who's become angry at their spouse at some point? Okay, okay. I know some hands are like, whoa. <laughs> okay, so, so ladies, it's important to understand. He's not a maniac necessarily, a, a murderous, ex murderer killer. He has such an anger. No, maybe it's something you said. <laughs> and it triggers him. Okay, you need to understand this. And men, you need to understand yourself. Why are you freaking out? Because you feel disrespected. It's a, it's, a, it's a switch on the inside of a man. If he feels disrespected, he reacts. He withholds love. It's like, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm stonewalling or I'm going to scream now or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't justify any ungodly behavior, okay? You just need to understand yourself. And then you spin on that cycle. That's the trouble. There's trouble. It's happening. And if you spin on that cycle for too long, what happens? The heart gets hurt. The heart gets wounded. So maybe for the guy, it's like, yo, when are my wife going to actually respect me or, 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 or value my voice or, you know, something along those lines? Or the lady might be, when is he going to, you know, love me in the way that I want? When is he going to be present? When is he going to just sit and just look me in the eye and talk to me, you know? Like ladies like that in the coffee shop 
eye to eye, face to face, staring into the depths of your soul. And this freaks men out. And women love it. And we would rather just come, come sit next to me next to the TV. We watch TV together. Come sit. Just, just sit. Come. We bonding. <laughs> Okay, so the men want shoulder to shoulder, the women want face to face. That freaks us out. Okay, but we have to learn, guys. We have to learn to stare back. Okay, be focused. Don't look at the TV behind her. Ah, <laughs> huh? yeah, I know the guilt is not going to When we go, we go to a restaurant, we make sure that the television's behind Andre. That is now the. It's like a game plan. So that we've I can. Learned. Yes. So we've learned. So you focus. Okay. But so if you're on the crazy cycle for, for some time, your heart gets hurt. Okay. And this is really important. So I want to, I want to show you Proverbs 13 verse 12. When this happens, when like you're hoping she's going to respect me instead of just talking down at me, or you're hoping he's going to treat me with love and, you know, maybe, value me. If that doesn't happen, it says hope deferred makes the heart sick. So you hope, it doesn't happen, you hope, it doesn't happen, you hope, it doesn't happen, you hope, you're on the crazy cycle, you're just spinning. And the result is the heart becomes sick. But it says about a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Oh, we've seen this so many times. When hope is deferred, when there's just been those wounds and you haven't dealt with it because you're like, just like, go get over it. I'm not going to talk to you about that again. I'm not going to pray with you again or whatever. The heart is still hurt and you don't deal with it, then there's trouble. Okay, so the disappointed will become the deceived. Okay, we sit with many couples where they want to kill one another. Okay, because they are like, he's bad, she's bad, she's so controlling, I can't stand her anymore. No, she's trying to not get hurt, and she's looking for love. And she's like, but he's such an angry monster. You know, no, he's just freaking out because you're disrespecting him. But now the heart has gotten wounded, the heart has become sick, and the heart influences your vision. So you're looking through these glasses, and all you see is he's a, on the extreme cases now, a monster. Well, she's just controlling. She's going to use me for my money and things like that. And then you're in trouble. Okay? So I know this is extreme. Maybe this doesn't, it's not relevant for everybody. But you need to continuously watch your heart and help one another to heal. Help one another to deal. Otherwise, you get to the point like, I can't stand her anymore. I can't stand him anymore. I want out. I want to go somewhere else. I know somebody else is going to be way better. No, nonsense. No, it's just, but if your heart has been wounded, so you need to make sure your heart gets healed up. So hope deferred makes the heart sick, but hope restored will make your heart whole. Okay, because what happens is when you get hurt, then you start thinking that person is bad or evil or something like that. I mean, there's extreme cases, but, but you lose your hope. But when hope is restored, your heart's going to be whole. Okay, so you need to understand the things that, you know, if you think like this woman, she, she got issues. Or this man, he's got issues. All women are probably like that, and all men are probably like that on one level or another. There is so much, so much the same. Obviously, there's uniqueness in every man and every woman, but there is so much that's the same. So it's important to restore your hope. So Sonic is, is going to share there. So if, if you find yourself in a position, maybe it's not, a hopelessness in terms of your whole marriage, but maybe it's a hopelessness in terms of certain areas of your marriage. We want to give you three tools that you can apply, either, either personally or together as a couple, where your hope will be restored. So the first thing is you need the right perspective. Okay, so Andre said, you know, the whole thing of, of loving and respecting, sometimes we, we think a partner is deliberately disrespecting us. You know, and, and the moment we go to that, to that perspective, you're not going to receive hope. You, it, you, you, it's a losing battle. So you, you need to tell yourself, my, my spouse is good-willed. I married a good-willed man. I married a good-willed woman. That's your, that's your starting point. Because if you didn't marry a good-willed man, why do you want to stay with him? You know, if he's really evil, there's really something evil, why fight for the marriage? 
you need to make up your mind that your spouse is goodwill, right? The right perspective, yep. the right context. Most couples go through the exact same things as you. You know, it's universal. You know, it's not exactly the same. But, you know, we often, or I, I'm often the one who asks, you know, would other people fight about the same thing? And Andre is just so realistic. And yes, of course, you know, I'm always the one asking the question. The bottom line is the right context is that all of us are in the same boat. All of us are fighting for our marriages. You're not alone. Actually not alone in your, in your pursuit of a marriage that is all. And then the right confession. We, we hear that often, you know, where people would actually just say, but I don't like my spouse or my spouse can only get this right for so long. And then you, you actually start speaking death over your marriage. But if you can, if you can stop speaking death, and you start speaking a lot, it will do wonders. It will do, yep. it will, it will, it will sow seeds of hope and it will sow seeds of wholeness in your marriage. Yeah, absolutely. So to summarize, to fan the flame, you can put on the next slide, fire your spouse from being the one that should fulfill you in life. Okay? Number two, you will have trouble. How about laughing about it? Instead of just being upset about it. Number three, contend for hope. Make sure your heart gets healed up if you want to have that eight or nine out of ten kind of marriage. And I know some of the, the dating people are like, what is this guy talking about? These people are weird because we have such a wonderful relationship. <laughs> Until you get married and the babies come and you have action work pressure, etc. then you have challenges. And we want to go for, come on, let's have, let's fan the flame. Let's pursue one another again. And let's help one another to have whole and beautiful hearts. Amen. So please stand with me. I want to pray for us. And then uh, we want you guys to, in your, with your spouse or your dating partner, we want you to discuss something. Um, but before that, I, wanna, I, wa I just want us to pray for hearts to be healed, to restored, and for hope, hope to be restored. Not for a five out of ten, nine out of ten. Yeah? That is what God wants for all of us. Beautiful, beautiful relationships, beautiful marriages that last. I want to date my wife when we're 85. That's my mission. Still, pursue her and be passionate about her. But then you have to. The source is God. And then you need to do your conflict right to protect your heart. So let me pray for us. Father, Lord, we thank you. God Almighty, you're the God of hope. You're the God of love. And so, Lord, we pray that this evening, Lord, that you'll heal our hearts. Lord, I pray for each one of us to be more aware of our partner's heart and the state of their hearts, to help them find uh, healing and, and restoration. And Lord, I pray for each one of us that we'll be aware of our own hearts and that we would be brave to apologize, the first to forgive and the first to forget. That we'll be the happiest, the bravest, God, I pray for that. Lord, we pray for hearts to be restored and healed and blessed. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So just on the next slide, just want to mention this. On Sunday, I'm going to share a message about being unburdened. So if you're struggling with burdens, this Sunday, I will be sharing about being unburdened and joyful in life. Okay, and then just go to the other slide, the question. So you just for the 10 minutes. Um, I want you guys to chat. Rate your marriage or if you're dating, um, just rate it. How do you feel? How's it going? I've learned that <clears throat> it's more important how my wife rates it than how I rate it. <laughs> so, uh, But don't say 9 out of 10. Say 73 out of 100. Yes. Okay. 100. Be, be more specific. Specific. Very specific. Okay. And then you will have trouble. Then I want you to just talk about that. Who's first to apologize, to forgive, to forget. Just talk a little bit about 
when you do miss one another, how do you handle it? And how can you maybe handle it better? And then if you feel comfortable to do so, just to pray together. Okay, and then we're going to, we're having a break. So just for 10 minutes or so, you may take your seats. Have a chat. We're here to help. So now this is your moment. Rate it and then talk about when there is trouble.